So today I'm going to go through this tutorial on the operator. And if you look back on the course map, you'll see that we're going to we have this module for 2 weeks. So we're going to be spending a lot of time out here. Um, this is a really important module because you really have to understand how functions work and pass information as well as operator because you use these two things in all, virtually every program you write. So let's take a look at the tutorial operator. Pay particular attention to the increment operator which is the plus plus. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it's just a really sweet piece to use. You just put plus plus on the end of a variable and it automatically increments it. Then there's this increment operator, that's a plus equal. This is shorthand, and I'll show you the long way to write that out. My all-time favorite is the ternary operator. It has three parts to it. And then the mod operator. Um, you're going to be using these a lot. In fact, I have students at the end of this course where I ask you to do uh, a certain project that you have to use the mod operator and you have to use the ternary and they go all in a scramble because they don't remember how to do it. So pay attention now because this is going to come up again and again. As you go into your other language classes, guess what? I bring up the ternary again and the mod again and I keep repeating these things because they're very useful tools. And um, it's, it's like having a, 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 a fine set of screwdrivers. You know, if you just have a straight edge screwdriver, you can only do certain things with it. So then if you get a Phillips screwdriver, then you can handle most jobs until you start working on an automobile where you need a torque head, a torque, torque screwdriver. So as you do more things and get more of an expert at screwdriving, you need more better screwdrivers to, to accomplish what you need to do. Same thing with programming. So as you get to be more of a sophisticated programmer, you need to know the ternary operator, the mod, all these different operators. And they show up in all the other languages. So let's take a look and do some, some uh, do the tutorial. This is basically what you're developing into is that jackknife that has all the tools in it. So instead of just adding and multiplying and subtracting and dividing, you're learning a whole another set of tools. And all along, you've been using these ever since you've been in uh, grade school with the plus, the minus, the multiplication, and the division. So we're going to add more operators. But So when I say operators, that's what I'm talking about. These little signs that do things to sets of numbers or strings. So here's the new ones we're going to add on. Concatenation and addition. This is used twice for two things. And in computer science, this is called overriding. So if you have two strings, it's going to glue the two strings together or concatenate those two strings. If you have a string and a number, it's going to glue them together. It's going to change that number into a string and glue them together. If you have two numbers, then all of a sudden this turns back into addition, and it's going to add the two numbers up and display them. So JavaScript is pretty smart, but you have to understand what rules it's, go it's working by. Here's increment operator. This is the add and assign, so you know the assign operator from previous weeks. So we're adding and assigning, and I'll show that to you in a minute. The ternary, which is like an on-off switch. It's a really short, short version, a one-line version of the if-else statement. And then the mod op operator. So we'll look at all of those. Now, if you want to work along with me, go on out to the website and get this start program. <coughs> and if you do a right mouse click and save link as, then you can bring down the file. If you just click on the link, it, it will just display it.
Now I want to save my original coding, so what I'm going to do right away is I'm going to open it up in my text editor, and then I'm going to say, file save as, and I'm just going to call operator demo. Oh, you know what it did? It, I don't have the file out there. If we go into that, you'll see that it was uh, file not found. Let me check on that again. Yeah, file not found. <laughs> I have to get the file out there. Oh, let's take a look real quick at the code itself. So I'm going to open up the code, and we'll just take a quick walkthrough so you can see. Again, notice I have my comment block with the actual file name, operator demo. And again, let me point out the naming conventions. I start lowercase. I use camel case with no spaces. My extension is lowercase always. And then I write a description of what this file is accomplishing. So in this case, we're showing the various JavaScript operators. I have when it was written, and here's my revision date. So I got to update my revision date because I'm going to be changing it today. So I'm going to do 02, 09, 11, put my initials in, and add uh, functionality from or using tutorial. So once that's done, this is my title, operators. You want to always have a unique title so every tab is different on your browser. And then I go right into my script tag. Here's my C data, and I set up a function. So the function is called concatenate. Inside this function, I'm setting up a variable called first name with Yahido. Last name is Smith. And then I'm saying I'm, I'm going to demo my concatenation. This is my line break. Notice how that line break is inside my string. It's really important. Because keep in mind, we're kind of hiding this HTML from the browser so the browser doesn't get confused. And from JavaScript, because JavaScript doesn't like HTML. So we got to hide it inside the quotes. And then we concatenate the first name and the last name. So we say, welcome back, concatenate, or glue, a variable. How do we know this is a variable? It doesn't have quotations. Excellent. And then we concatenate. We concatenate a space to the last name. Again, no quotes, so it's a variable. And then we do our final concatenation. Now this wrapped around because I don't, it's, uh, my, my screen is too large. There, there's the full line. So here's the end of my sentence, an exclamation mark. And then here's my line break that I'm feeding to the browser. Again, hiding it from JavaScript. Now, when the page first loads, what happens with this block of code? Where does it, what happens to it? Does it run? No, it doesn't. Where does it go? Yeah, it goes up into the browser's temporary memory. And, you know, in the classroom here, I always picture that temporary memory in that whiteboard up on the right-hand side. Uh, but wherever you picture it, it's the browser's temporary memory. It just sits up there waiting until the program calls it by name, concatenate parentheses. That goes into RAM? Yeah, yeah, this goes into RAM. Yep, yep. And, and the only way that the browser can find it or Java can... JavaScript, JavaScript can find it is by its name, okay? And I'll sh and we'll call that in a minute. Oh, look, I have more functions here. 
Now this is called stubbing, and this is this is a great way to write code because you get your functions working, but you don't have to spend all your time writing lines and lines of code. So here's my function increment. Notice each of these function names are verbs. Well, ternary isn't mod modulus is I should say demo ternary demo mod. I should make these into verbs. But that being as it may, here's our increment, and all we do is we say uh, document write demo using incrementing. So when we do call this function, this stub, something's going to show on the screen and we know it's working. If it doesn't work, you know, this is almost as simple as we can do it. So, And the only thing I would change here is I would change this to say end of increment. I put a little note in here. This is something I've just started doing the last few years, and it's really paid off because sometimes these functions get to be pretty long. Here's end of ternary. And finally, end of modulus. I also like to put two, two blank lines between each function just so they stand out from each other. You kind of want to make this readable just like you would in paragraphs in English. So do you see how these really kind of stand out now from each other? And as this code gets really, really long, you'll know that this curly brace goes with this curly brace. Keep those curly braces in line. Remember that's a block of code with this with, with its name signature line or its name. All right, then we end up our script. We put our HTML hat back on, leave our head, go into our body, start displaying the page. So here's our H1. Here's our H2. And then we jump into the script again, and here's where we're going up into that RAM memory, and we're saying, all right, call the concatenate code. We turn the script off. Output a regular H2, turn the script back on, do an increment, and you see how I do this for all of these, for each of these. Now, what's an alternative that I could do instead of turning my script on and off, on and off, on and off? What could I do up here to output my H2? Document write. And then I could take this line right here. Put it inside my quotes, because remember, we in JavaScript, we got to hide those strings. Don't forget my close quote and my semicolon. And then my next line, I can just say increment and call that function and then delete these three lines here. Now, I'm not going to do that with each one, but do you see how you can bury your H2, and instead of flip-flopping back and forth between script and HTML, like I do here, you can do it all in one block, if you put it inside a string. Everybody see the difference? Now, what's, what's, which way do you want to do it? Boy, that's the question. Let's do it the right way. Which way is the right way? Is there such a thing? No. It depends on the situation. It depends on your mood, what phase the moon is in, and how much gravity is, is at the place where you're sitting. So some, some programmers don't mind switching back and forth all the time. Other programmers like things in blocks and like things, you know, once you're in script, they like to stay in script. Now, I used to be this way and do everything all in script, but then I started programming in PHP, and in PHP we mix things up all the time. So I've gotten real flexible either way. Um, for me, the bottom line is what's ever easiest for other people to read, other programmers. Or that means myself in the future. I'll come into this six months later and I'll go, what did he write? Who wrote this crap? Or I'll come in here and say, oh, I see what he's doing. He's calling a method. He's calling, a, uh, he's setting up an H2. He's calling another method. And then I'll consistently see my pattern. 
Now, the way I have this right now is pretty confusing because I start up a really good pattern and then I start switching back to my other style. But I wanted to point out the two different styles that you can use. Everybody understand how these are synonymous? These are the same? And either way works. Um, it really depends on what your mood is for the day. Well, we messed with this code, so let's go in. Let's go into our uh, browser and see if we broke anything. So I'll do a refresh, and everything's looking good. And what did we do? Here's our demo concatenate, and here you can see we added the first name and the last name. We concatenated them. There's that exclamation mark. You see how we tied in the strings with what was in the variable, the first name variable the last name variable, and then the end of sentence. And then we put a BR in there. And then here's our stubs for the other functions. This is our demo, so we know all of these are working. I do have a validation error, so I'm going to take a look at my validation error. This is my HTML validation. Oh, and it says I can't put an H2 in here. This is the code I just rewrote. Ah, I hear the answer already. Very good. So what did I leave out? I left out my C data. So I'm going to notice another. This is a great trick to use. You'll use it a lot. I clicked on the number, and that highlighted the whole line so I could copy that. I come down here inside my script. I move my cursor right over here to the left and do my paste. And do you see how it kept my indentation? I go up here and get my stop C data. Again, I click on the line number. This works in uh, Word. It works in almost all text editors. And then I'll close off my C data. Now, I don't have to do that here because I'm not burying any HTML inside my quotes. And I don't have to do it here. Now, a good idea just by style would be to be consistent. And every time you write a script tag, I would put in your C data and your stop C data. Consistency will really pay off as you as you the more you program. So I'll try my page again, and now I can look down here, and I can see that I have my HTML is valid. And if I'm unsure of myself, I can open up my Firebug, open up my console, refresh my page, and I'll see that I have some, uh, that I, right now I have some warnings, but you can ignore these, these blue warnings. Um, if you have line numbers and code in here, that's when you have to worry. I'm not quite sure what this is about, and I haven't, I haven't taken the time to track it down. But it really isn't affecting your direct running of your code. Firebug will tell you when you have things wrong with its line numbers. Well, now let's tell JavaScript to add instead of concatenate. So inside your, your concatenate, so go inside your concatenate function up in the head and add these new lines of code. Here we're going to do a document write demo addition as opposed to demo concatenation. Notice I did these in bold, start bold, stop bold, and here's a new line break. And then I set up a variable called first num. It's three without quotes because it's a number. Variable second num, 42. And then I say document write first num plus and plus second num. Add it together, r first num plus second num. So it should say, what should it say when we output it? 
should say 3 plus 42 is 45, right? Well, give it a try. All right, what do you see when you look at the page? 3 and 42, well, that came out right. Added together are 342. Uh-oh, what's wrong? Something definitely wrong. Notice how I use pretty smart data because this tells me right away that this is not the right number. <coughs> you want to use examples like that so your brain can really catch on to these things and doesn't just say, oh, yeah, it's okay, and move on. So here's the rule. When you add, I'm going to go back to the code. When you, when you, when you do the, this uh, operator with a string and a string, it concatenates or glues them together. But what about here? This is a number and a number. Why isn't that adding together? and then putting it onto these strings. What order is this happening in? It's going number, string, number, string, number, number, string. Do you see how they're all mixed together with the strings? So in order to get this separate, we can put parentheses around these two numbers, and that's going to happen first before these outside parentheses happen. So let's see if I have that in code here. Yeah, here's our revised code. We're going to, don't lose that concatenation now, but we're going to say run this first. So it's going to take this number, and now a number and a number is going to do what? Is that going to add or concatenate? It's going to add. So that should come up to uh, 7, right? Go ahead and put that code in and give it a try. You got the parentheses in? Make sure you do a save. And now what do we get? Uh-oh, still not right. Oh, wait, it is right. 3 and 42 is 45. Whoop, I'm sorry. My uh, test data was different in my head. I was thinking it was 4 plus 5. I'm sorry. So do you see how that worked? It saw these each as numbers, it did the numbers, and then it converted them into strings to add them onto this string and this string. In uh, Notepad++, your strings are what color? What are they? Oh, they're red just like this? Okay, good. Good. So it's real easy to see what's a string and what isn't. All right, so everybody comfortable with the plus and the plus, the concatenate and the addition. And what's the computer science term for that? When one thing does two different jobs? Overriding. We, over, we were overriding the plus operator, all right? So it's a concatenation and the plus operator. All right, here's the next one. This is an easy one, the increment operator. So go up in your function, your increment function, and we already have this line right here using incrementing. So write yourself a, a comment here where in English. Incrementing the most often used is for a loop. And ne in the next couple of weeks, we're going to get some for loops, but I'm just going to introduce these to you right real quick, and then I'll go into them deeper in a couple of weeks. But basically, this is three statements. We're saying our variable x is starting out 0. We're going to test it until it gets to be 4. And then we're going to drop out. And then we're going to increment our x. As long as our counter, our x, is less than 4, we're going to run this code. Again, we'll do the for loop in a couple weeks, but I just want to introduce it to you now because this is where you're going to see the plus plus most often. And then what are we outputting? We're saying document, write this as loop number, and then we show what count we're at. So this is like counting on our fingers. Do a new line. We increment, test it, run it, increment, test it, run it. And this is our loop right here.
Now, when you run your page, you should see uh, your loop and your counter for what? Four lines. The first counter is going to be zero, then it's going to be one, two, three, and then it's going to be four, so it's going to drop out of your loop. Everybody get that to happen? So you can see here's our increment operator that automatically added our uh, information on. Now there's two kinds of increment operators. There's a post increment and a, a pre increment. So after your for loop, I want to I want you to do some demo code so we can look at this, and I'll just walk through the code really quick. So here's our document, right? We're, we're telling, we're going to put on the screen that it's pre and post, and we're going to start with a number. Now here's what's going to happen, is if we have a formula like this, where we take a variable and add it on to another number, then the pre-increment is going to increment the variable first, so this is going to become 4, and then it's going to be added on. If we have the plus plus after the variable, then it's going to do this addition first, so it'll take whatever my number is, which now I think is 4, and then it's going to add it to 5, so that's going to be 9, and then it's going to increment it to 4, this is going to increment up to 5. So do you see this is going to increment first and then add. This is going to increment app, or it's going to add and then it's going to increment. So do you see the pre and post? So go ahead and type that in and then we'll run the program to, to see how, how it looks. All right, what's happening in this code? Here's the output. First of all, you can see your for loop. And here's our counter, 0, then x becomes 1, x becomes 2, x becomes 3. And then here's where we do our pre-increment, and it says 3 plus 5 is 9. Well, what's happening here? It's displaying the actual variable value, but then it's incrementing it to 4, and then it's doing the calculation. So it's 4 plus 5 is 9. So now this variable is 4. Oh, I do it right here. So now my number has 4. And then remember, this is the post increment. So we're going to take 4 plus 5 is 9. That matches. But what happened to my number after we did this addition? With a post increment, it incremented up, and it became 5. So the pre-increment it, it bumps up the variable before it does the calculation. With a post increment, it, it does the calculation and then bumps up the number. Now, personally, I use post increment 99.9% .9 of the time just because I don't have to want to deal with this. But there's certain instances where you want to up, up your counter. I was just going to ask, like, what would you use? It's... A lot of it is, is your frame, frame of mind, is your programming, but if you have a variable and you want to say, well, yeah, yeah, I want to bump up and then add it or multiply it or whatever, then you would do a pre-increment. Just understand that you can go either way, and then myself as a programmer, I just always use post-increment just because it keeps my mind less cluttered, all right? Now, when we go back to this loop, let me go back up to this loop. Does it matter, and you try this out, noodle around, put your pre-increment here and move these two pluses over in front of the x. Does it change anything? So go ahead and move this and make this a pre-increment x. Run your page again, and does it change anything? Who can tell me? No, it doesn't change. The reason is, is we're not doing any arithmetic here. You see, when we do arithmetic inside these parentheses, that's when the pre and the post really happens. Here, it's incrementing first and then, and then uh, looping around. But it's not being added onto anything or multiplied or subtracted. 
So it really doesn't matter if you increment it before you do this or after you do this because it's just a number. You can, yeah, you'll see them out in the wild on the web. You'll see it plus plus x. You'll see it x plus plus. And it doesn't matter either way because it's not being added on to anything else. All right, so don't let that confuse you. But you can see why I want to introduce it in the language because you're going to see it out there. You're going to say, well, I learned it the other way. Now you learned it both ways. Again, I use uh, the post increment. It's just easier for me to do. And I think most programmers nowadays, from the code I look at, I think most programmers use the post, post increment. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you left the plus plus off your for, off your for loop and filled the page up and went off into never never land. Yeah, went in an endless loop. How did you stop it? Uh, it gave me a more, uh, warning message. Okay, so Firefox came up says, "Hey, are you sure you want to go off to Mars?" And Mark said, "No, I don't." And he's and he stopped it. Another thing you do is just close your browser. Oh, yeah, that's what it was doing. It was filling up your memory. Yep, yep. Over and over and over and over and over. Really fast, too. Really nice and fast. When we get into uh, looping in a couple weeks, you'll see how easy it is to do that. All right, here's the plus equal. I call it the plus equal. I guess officially it's the uh, concatenate assign. Now, here's the long way to do things. You can say my number is going to get the value of or be assigned my number plus 3. So we take my number, we add 3 to it, and then we store it into my number. Again, remember that assignment operator is a big, huge arrow going from the right, and it's going over here to the left. Uh, you would you would set it up here up before the code. You would say variable my number equals, so it'd be up higher in your code. But here's the short version. You can just say plus equals three. So this right here is the short version of sp of typing out my number twice. Now it looks a little odd, but once you start doing it, you'll really like it. It also works for multiplication. So here you can see and. You can go ahead and type this into your code, put it in your assignment operator function. Let's see. I, oh, I put a note here. Put it inside your function increment. So we're going to say my number plus equals 100. And then we print out a label and the value. Um, this looks weird to me. Shouldn't this, this line right here should go in between the two document rights, I think. Shouldn't it? Yeah. Well, and then I, then I multiply it here. This is an asterisk. And I multiply it so this will come out to be 200. Let's see what my result looks like. And here's the results right here. So you probably got, got figured out that operators aren't all that scary. They're just really, really basic operations or things that happen to your variables and your strings. Now I'm going to take you into uncharted territory, the ternary operator. Now this is a very cool operator. So go down into your ternary function. And first, we're going to write it the long way. Boy, this makes my fingers ache for all the typing. So here's our Boolean variable. And then we're going we're gonna to say 
what our value is. This is going to say true. And then we're going to say, if this is true, then print this out. Otherwise, the program will not loop again. Now be careful, don't run this because this will go into an infinite loop, much like we just talked about with the for loop, because we have to change this variable. So right in here, we'll have to add a change. But get this code written in, and then, then I'll take you a little further on. As you type this, notice the indentation. So at the top of my function, here's my start curly, my end curly. Then I go in three spaces. And underneath my if, I have my start and stop curly, my else, my curlies. And then inside of each of those, I go in three spaces for the actual code. So keep your indenting so it looks, it's blocky like this. It'll make your code much easier to read and make it look much more professional. So I, I want to apologize. This isn't a loop. I was, I was seeing this loop again. I was assuming it's a loop. This is just an if-else statement. So I'm coming in here, and I'm testing to see if this is true or false. So if it's true, it's going to run this code. If it's false, it's going to run this code. So you can run this. It won't get into a loop. You'll be fine. Everybody see that again? This first, this if statement, if this is true, then whatever's inside the curly braces is going to run. If it's false, everything inside the curly braces here is going to run. Now, you could say like this, if loop again equals equals true, <coughs> but it's so much easier just to do it this way. If this is either going to be true or false because we set it up as a Boolean, so you don't have to do the equals equals. But beginning programmers, they are usually more comfortable doing it this way. But I, I just say if loop again. It's either going to be true or false. And the if is always testing for true or false. That's all it's looking for. So here you can see the, the, your output is your loop again is going to be true, the program will loop again, and that's the end. If you change it in your code and hard code it to false, then it'll say loop again is false, and it will not loop again. Notice how my output, I made that all caps so it really stands out. I don't have to look at it too close. Again, that helps you debug things. Everybody see the difference how these two different lines of code run? Well, that's a lot of typing, a lot of lines of code. So let's do this. Let's use the ternary. And here we're going to set up our result is going to be an uh, uh, empty string. And this is how the ternary works. This is the first part of the ternary. If this is true, then after the question mark, this part will run. If this is false, then this second part will run. Now, I put this all on two lines, uh, just so you could see the code. But it's really part one, part two, and then part three down here. So it's parentheses, question mark, colon. That makes a ternary. And what I did is I took the answer, so if it's true, I took this answer and I assigned it, right here's the assignment operator, I stuck it into the result bucket. If it's false, I took this statement, this string, and I assigned it into result false. So instead of having all of this code here, these, what is this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight lines of code, I did it with two lines. I could have done it with one line with a ternary. And then I say result, which would be either this string or this string, and I print it out. So here's my same output. And I'm testing against my if-else to see if it matches. 
So here's the three parts of the ternary. First you say, is this true or false? If it's true, then this goes into output. If it's false, this goes into output. Does everybody see that? This is a really, really slick uh, construction. So here's another example. Up oh, too big. So here I ask my, here's my statement. Is the temperature less than 33? Well, here's my temperature right up here. Temperature has been assigned what value? 33. So is temperature less than 33? Is that true or false? It's false. So which color is going to go into in, the document right? The red. So water is not frozen. What if I set uh, the temperature to the current temperature? What is it, about 20 below? So 20 below, is that less than 33? That's true, so it's going to say water is frozen. That's what's going to print out. Now notice here, this ternary is inside the document, right? So we're not storing it in a variable and printing out the variable. We're just sending it straight out to the screen. We're either saying water is frozen or water is not frozen. Do you see how much sweeter this is than an if-else statement? Now, when do you want to use a ternary? Well, whenever you have an on-off, yes-no, uh, true-false condition, then you go to a ternary. If you have multiple choices, then you want to use if-else, if-else, if-else. Now we can get really fancy. You all know how to use the prompt. So you use the prompt. You set up a default. So you say, what is the temperature in Fahrenheit? And you have the default, and then depending upon what the person types in, you can come up with a true or false answer. So in your ternary, uh, well, we won't do it now because of time, but you can add your prompt statement in. You all know how to do the prompt. And then you can see, depending upon what the person types in, it will come up either frozen or not frozen. The ternary is a primitive operator, and it's built into the language. If else is a special function that's added on. So that means a ternary is going to run much, much faster than an if else. Now, in a little program like we're doing in here today, it really doesn't make any difference. But if you're looking for a really uh, uh, speed efficient program, not necessarily in JavaScript, but say in Java, and you really want your program to run fast, like on a mobile device, then you want to go to the ternary. So it's, if you use a lot of if-elses, the ternary can make your program run much more efficiently. All right, let's go on to the modulus. Now, the modulus is all about division. And, the, and instead of getting an answer, we're going to get the remainder. Here's what you can do with a modulus. You can count by fives, tens. You can figure out odd, even, you, which would help you do zebra stripes on a spreadsheet, where every other row is a different color. Um, you can figure out leap years. You say, is it divisible by four, plus some other criteria? So. The mod operator is very useful for doing leap years. Um, lots of times, a, a real common programming pro program, uh, problem is how many coins are for a given amount. So I, if I have $1.25, how many nickels would it be? That would be mod 5. How many dimes would it be? Mod 10. How many quarters? Mod 25. So. Go to your modulus function and go ahead and type in this code and then you can explore what this modulus is all about. Now I have a chart down here where I'm going to show you what's going to happen. So don't be, uh, just type in the code now and then we'll analyze it when you're done typing. On the code that I'm using division here and I'm using the mod operator. So with the output of the code, you'll be able to see the results of division. 
and you'll see the results of the mod operator. Also, I'm throwing in a new function that we're going to explore quite a bit, and that's called parse int. And what that means is it says take this integer, or take this string, and parse it into an integer. So take, take the result of this string and make it into a number. An integer is a number. So don't let some of these things... Yeah? What's a float? A float is a number with a, a decimal point. So like, on, uh, yeah, like money. Money would be a float. An int would be, what would you use int for? Yeah, what's an example? When would you use an int? Would you use it for shoe size? Why, why not for shoe size? Because you can have half, like 10 and a half, so it would be 10.5. When could you use an int? Oh, okay, counting something where things wouldn't break into pieces. How about age? Oh, attendance, you're either here or not. Yeah, good, you were here six days. Well, we could say six and a half days, but um, in, in uh, business programming, you use floats most of the time because we're always splitting things up. But ints are much smaller, much faster. So uh, the only time you wouldn't use an int for age is if you're, less, is if you're under five because people, little, little people under five are always saying, well, I'm three and a half. I'm three and three quarters, so they need floats. But us older folks, we just do it in ints. Okay, so let's take a look at what happens when we run this program. So here's our loop going through our 10 times, zero through, I'm sorry, 11 times, zero through 10, so there's our counter. And when we divide it by five, Um, 0 divided by 5 is 0, right? 1 divided by 5 is 0. These are all right. How about 5 divided by 5? You can do this in your head. I know you can. Is that correct? 5 divided by 5 is 1. How about 6 divided by 5? 7, 8, 9 divided by 5. It's all 1, right? Here's 10 divided by 5. Do that in your head, too. We come up with a 2. Now look what the mod operator does, which looks like a percent sign. 5 divided by, or 0 divided by 5 is 0. 1 divided by 5 is 1. This is the remainder that's left over after the division. 2, 3, 4. What kind of remainder is there of mod 5 mod? 5 divided by 5 is 1. We know that. How many is left over? Zero. So then we go through the same pattern again, and when we come to when it's e evenly divided, we get a mod of zero. So what you can do with your program is you can say, okay, if the mod of five is zero, then we're going to say five, uh, zero, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Can we do that with 2? So we go 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. And we can use that for odd and even. Can we count by 3s? If we say mod 3, it's going to be 3, 6, 9, 12. Do you see how this works? So by using the mod, we can see when things are divisible. And so we can, we can go in chunks like that. This pattern is really, really important. Well, let's get fancy, and you can either copy your for loop or you can modify it. I would just copy it and then, then uh, modify it. But here we're going to do another loop of 11. We're going to parse int by 3 or do our mod 3. And if that equals 0, then we're going to write out our output. And I'm going to show you what it's going to look like. Here's our output, 0, 3, 6, 9. Now, if you want to do it a little bit higher, you could do this. You could do this loop, say, to 100 if you want to, and it'll show you the patterns of threes up to 100. Again, this is saying, is there any remainder? It's changing that into a number, and it's comparing that number against zero. Yeah. Oh, great question. Um, there's a gotcha with parse int. 
And if it starts with an odd number like, an, uh, like a zero, it thinks you're counting an octal. So instead of doing things in decimal like we're expecting, all of a sudden you're, you're, you're doing all your stuff in octal. So by putting that, that, that comma 10, you tell Parson, I want it in decimal, I want it in decimal all the time. Um, it's a bug that bit me several years ago. It took me a couple days to figure out, and so I've taught it ever since. Uh, and it comes the way I, I label my uh, folders with 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03. When I got up to 0, 09, that turned into octal. And uh, I couldn't figure out why he's getting all these weird numbers. Well, it was because Parsit was counting in octal instead of uh, decimal. So that's what that comma 10 is about. Great question. Now, this is one of those things that you never imagine you're going to need, but then when you're aware of it, you all of a sudden you say, oh, yeah, I could do this, this, and this with the mod operator. So it's one of those occasions of you don't know what you don't know, and when, once you learn it, then you say, well, this is really useful. And the more programming you do, the more you use the mod operator. Yeah, you didn't get the first one to work? All right, I'll leave that up here and... When you have it working, you should see something that looks like this. Now, the most often that you're going to use the mod operator is you're going to use the mod operator and the ternary. And I throw this into projects whenever I can. So pay attention to this piece because it combines two things really well. So here's another, another for loop. We're going to loop this around 11 times. And what we want to know, is it odd or even? So first we're going to say document right x is, and we're looking at our counter here. And then we're going to say document right x mod 2, is that equal to 0? So we're going to say, is, it, is this true or false? If x, our counter, mod 2 equals equals 0, then that's true. It's going to show. It's going to print out even. Otherwise, it's going to print out odd. So, do you see how I use the ternary in here? Here's here's the condition. If it's true, if it's false. And then I'll take you down and I'll show you. And you can see that zero is even. One is odd. Two is even. Three is odd. Now, if you were looping through a spreadsheet, you you could you would know to do. Uh, the first row one color, the second row another color, the first color, second color, and you could zebra stripe uh, a chart. This is useful if you want to put a heading on, on uh, the left side of the page and a chapter, chapter number on the right side of the page. So you can flip back and forth. Can you put that stuff in a table? Yep, you could do this in a table, absolutely. So... Um, this, this is a really, really powerful construction here, and we're using the ternary and the mod together to determine if a page is odd or even, or true or false. Very, very useful. Let's see if I have it out there. I might have to get this code out on my website. Oh, it is out there. So here's the complete code if you want to see how all these things fit together. It's also nice if you just can't figure out a bug, then you can look at this finished code and compare it with your own code and see what it looks like. So I have the finished out there, but I don't have the start. So I have to get the start out there. So now you should have a working knowledge of some of the more advanced operators in JavaScript. And what you learned today and what you experienced is, is you will find it in Java, you'll find it in C Sharp, PHP, VB.net, virtually all the modern computer languages. And just a quick summary, you now know about concatenation and addition. And what happens when you use the same symbol for two things? What's that called? Overriding, excellent. Here's our increment operator. 
our plus equals, both nice shortcuts. Here's our ternary because it has three parts. And here's our mod, our modulus. And there you have it. Keep this code handy. You can use it as a reference in the future.